All right. There you go. So looky here. All righty. So this was the, the deal. And um, this is what I was talking about, about the questions. They're still going to be divided up along the same categories we've seen before in this proportion for total points, but they're going to be much simplified. So let's not worry about it too much. And then again, have we got any questions about any particular slide or people want me to just go through the deck? Well, it looks like we're going to go through the 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 um, the whole deck, and then we will hit okay. questions as we go. We'll go through the deck then. <laughs> One of the things about uh, tree growth and everything, remember, it's temperature and photo period sensitive. Um, if it's not warm and sunny, we're going to have some issues. Diameter growth is uh, governed by spacing, and this is one of those interesting things. If you plant trees on a two by two spacing or a 12 by 12 spacing, you'll get about the same volume of wood. The only difference will be is some of it will be in the small diameter class, three, four inches, and some of them will be in the larger diameter classes. So that's an interesting thing about the forest. And if you think about when we look at the landscape, we see trees that are the co-dominant ones, the average height. This is true of that spacing game. Um, all the trees are going to be the same height, regardless of spacing, as a general rule of thumb. But the, whether the diameter changes has got a lot to do with that. Um, this is one of those issues about where is the soil the thinnest? Well, on top of the hill, could gravity move everything down? And the available water is the same thing. Gravity moves things downhill. So generally, we see the best site qualities low down on the hillside rather than up above. All of these definitions in the life cycle thing are just something you need to take a look at on the slide. The tree cookie parts. Um, this is one of those things. If you take a look at annual growth ring, we see that the light wood there's something that happened in the springtime when it's growing very fast, the cells are large, and then as it starts to slow down, um, we get the darker rings in the late summer, fall, and some of these uh, sap stainings that are in here indicating that it was really moist and good growing and then things started drying out in that. The xylem, if you think about xylem and phloem, xylem moves all the water and nutrients up the phloem is a thin layer. Um, it's the inner bark uh, that moves all the sugars back down to feed the tree and store stuff in the roots. So the trick here is the cambium divides and the outside is going to form the phloem. And when it dies, that's going to end up as the outer bark providing protection. And the inner pieces are going to form the xylem. And after a while, you uh, things don't live forever. So you get this heartwood, which is uh, essentially dead cells. And that's what provides the, the stiffness to trees, is that heartwood. Photosynthesis. This is something we've always had some questions about. The uh, typical equations you see in some books, or one I have in parentheses here, it doesn't account for the source of the O2. And this is the thing about what's happening here. There's hydrolysis of water. Without water, you're really stuck because the oxygen that's released in the atmosphere came from the water molecules that the tree took up. And the sugars are the key to, excuse me, the sugars here are the key to growth. In the identification of thing, any tree that I give you to identify will come from one of those two books. Um, as far as I'm concerned on the task, the keys, if you want to use them, help yourself. Um, that's what they're there for. Remember that keys are paired choices. If it's not this trait, it's some other trait. And this is the general division of how most keys are set up. If we look at uh, plants that have uh, needles 
um, versus those things that have broad leaves. And then the question is, are they simple or compound? And are they, um, opposite world and alternate on the on the stems and whatnot. We don't get into this uh, plant keys that are involved in winter. So don't worry about that part. I'm only gonna give you things with leaves on them. Crown canopy class, it's always one of those things. What do you do with the forest? The dominant trees out there are the ones that stick up above <clears throat> the average uh, height of the forest. They get sunlight from above in the sides. Codominance, the average height. They only get sunlight from above. The intermediate trees are the ones that have their crowns stuck up into the bottoms of the codominance and they get no direct sunlight. So the question always comes, if you were gonna improve a forest stand, who do you take out first? It's not the dominance, it's those intermediates that are not growing and thin some of the codominance. The understory crown class are those things that are totally su suppressed. And then on the ground layers, you have all this stuff right here. Remember what's going on. All of this stuff, the nutrients that the trees take up, a lot of that ends up in the leaves. And when those fall back down and decompose, that's how the uh, materials that were taken out of the soil are recycled back in. So why do you need, not need to fertilize most forests? Well, it's because they're doing this recycling program here and occasionally, some nutrient input is, but we're not going to get into that in this, this program. Abiotic factors, that's the non-living parts. And this is the favorite word that uh, everybody gets all excited about. The edaphic factors are those things regarding the soil textures and depths and whatnot. Pyritic, um, everybody's familiar with wildfires and, pres and prescribed burns. The difference being is, a wildfire is an accident happening at some time, probably when the forest is really dry, it's not a good time to burn. Prescribed burns are done at a time when conditions are right to reduce the amount of fuel without damaging the forest and the soils underneath it. The biotic factors are the living parts and the anthropogenic ones are the influence from humans alone and we see a lot of times we fragment the forest, uh, we build roads, dams, uh, and invite invasive species. These are things that humans have done to it that uh, are unaffected. My favorite little chart is this one. Please take a note that if you are familiar with the physiographic provinces in Virginia, these are not the only groups of uh, timber types. This is a consolidation of many of them down to a simplified version, but let's take a look at what's happening. If we look at white pine and hemlock, we see these are dominant in the Blue Ridge province. Wild and shortleaf, dominant the Piedmont on the coast and virtually absent over in the Appalachian Plateau. The oak pine, more in tidewater than any place else, particularly the Appalachians. But if you look at the oak hickory type stands, they're dominant everywhere. So if you step out into the woods in Virginia, most likely you're gonna see an oak hickory stand unless something is uh, particular about the topography or the position on the hill or whatever. The same thing about the beech birch maple. These are things that are usually associated with more northern parts of the country. And where do you find them? Over in the plateau where the high country is. So thinking about where you are, it would not be a good idea, say, to try to grow shortleaf pine or loblollies in the plateau region, right? Clear cutting. One of those things a lot of people have questions about, but you get an even age stand and if you look at pine plantations, that's what you're gonna to do to them. You're gonna cut them as a final harvest, as a clear cut. You're gonna do a lot of intermediate cuttings along the way, but if, once you cut it, you're gonna plant it back. Seed tree method is a thing that if you're not gonna plant it, leave some seed trees and away you go. Shelterwood is 
one of the things that's becoming more dominant in hardwood management where the stand is reduced in density, things like dominant, some of the better co-dominant trees are left as a seed source. And these are for regeneration of species that require partial sunlight or shade. And things like the oaks do really well, hickories in this type of environment. Um, Selection cutting, so you end up with an uneven age stand, but the other side of that coin is if you go into the stand and take out some of the poorer trees and encourage the better ones to grow, you have a chance to go back in and each cut is an improvement cut to the stand, which increases its value over time. Silvicultural treatments. This is just, uh, you'll not find very many questions on this. In this year's test, so we won't worry about it too much. But uh, think about all of the things one can do in manipulating a stand. And we're seeing more emphasis on prescribed burning now so that wildfires don't get out of hand like they, they have been in, out west. Oh, excuse me. If you look at harvesting, that's that thing about the final cut in the rotation. In other words, we've gone in and done as much thinning and weeding and other things that uh, we could do with the, with the stand. And now we're ready to take that final crop out and start all over again. Forest health. The big thing we're talking about today is the lack of biodiversity in some areas or biodiversity that's being adversely impacted by invasive species. Forest fragmentation. Forests work best as a kind of a large group setting. And when we start sticking large acreage subdivisions in them. Um, not only do you impact forest health, but you also impact the ecology of the whole system. Uh, air quality. This is one of those things about urban forestry. If you want to improve your air quality, it's hard to say, well, we're not going to plant any trees. They cool cities. They also take out a lot of pollutants. And the aesthetics values of them certainly do increase uh, land, well, lot values for homes and whatnot. Global warming is something that's uh, dominant in the news these days. And there's a lot being written about it. Things certainly are changing. And this impact on stand types, as we look at the way the global temperatures are changing, we're seeing a shift of species northward because this, as it warms up, they're no longer able to tolerate those conditions if they were a cool species type plant. So we're seeing a change in the forest composition uh, starting. And recreation, this minimizing environmental impact, it makes a big difference where you put a trail where you put a place to ride uh, mountain bikes or trail bikes or four wheelers and whatnot. And that's becoming more and more of an issue is how do you provide recreational opportunities that people want without <clears throat> causing adverse environmental impacts. Sustainability. This is the package right here. The economic, social, and ecological factors involved in it. The way one obtains a lot of this is through forest policy, such as land use zoning. And Virginia has a good program, um, putting, putting large holdings or well, relatively, some of them are relatively small, but putting holdings into forest stall zones that are similar to agriculture. We always think of agricultural zones being for farming. Well, now we have a tool to put forest in forest stall zones and keep them um, in, in timber and timber production. The taxation is the way this program works. By putting them in that type of situation, the tax rate on the property goes down. So, Since we're not measuring plots, this is not a big deal, but it's something you should know about when you're looking at the plot data I give you. Remember, we were measuring trees in two-inch classes. 
It's either a 10, a 12, a 14, 16, 18, or whatever. In our world, we don't have 17-inch trees. So keep in mind that we're measured to a two-inch class. And when you go to average something, significant digits, it goes back to the two-inch class. Remember about merchantable heights. These are the rules set out in the 4-H Forestry Invitational Handbook. You have to have a minimum of one log that's 16 feet. And then you can add half logs to it. So we could have a, a one log tree or a one and a half log tree, but we can't have a half log. And this is the top um, diameter inside bark of the first major defect. And the question comes is how do you determine this? And that's the neat thing about Biltmore sticks. If you turn them sideways at 66 feet, the thickness of uh, the Biltmore stick approximates this top uh, limit. So that's where you're gonna figure the maximum log lengths in it. Anybody has any questions about that, put it in the chat room, please. Whee! This is an example of some plot data and that's probably what I'll give you, not this data, but something similar to it. So you have uh, a number of trees, uh, this plot happened to be a tenth of an acre. So if we look, we had seven trees. Remember, that's the question is, is how many trees per acre are there? There's 70. The average diameter is that whole thing. When we go through this thing, there are two inch classes, we end up with that. The volume came out of the volume table, which is based on the DBH and the number of logs. So a 14, lo 14 inch tree with one and a half logs, it's got 105 board feet in it. You add all these up, but my question to you is not how much board feet was in the plot, but how much board feet does the plot represent per acre? So you've got to remember to add a zero. And as Brent would probably tell you, John Rocket may give you a fifth acre plot. And then you have to remember to multiply by five instead of 10, but don't worry, we won't trick you. Based on the plot data, what's the stocking condition? This is the one question on the test that so many people neglect to answer and it's worth some points. If you read the chart, number of trees per acre. Ha, ah, where'd that come from? Number of trees per acre, 70. So there's 50, 60, 70. Average, average DBH, if we go back here and look, when we did all that, there's your average DBH. So these are the two numbers you need, this one and this one. And if you simply plot the number of trees per acre to the average DBH, we see that this stand is well stocked, meaning there's no point in looking at doing a timber cut at this time. That stand has room to grow as we see by the difference right here. If the, if you ended up in the overstock stand, then the answer to the question is gonna be, well, yeah, it's time to take a look at it. If you're right here, you may need to think strongly about it, but if you're over in here someplace, it's obviously time for a cut. If it's understocked, then we may need to take a look at doing some manipulation to improve regeneration. So that's the purpose of the chart that came from the plot data. The other way we determine how well stocked the stand is and whatnot is with the prism. And although we don't do a lot of this at the state level, if you go to national, they are gonna ask some questions about it. So I will include a question about prisms the idea here is that with a prism, if a tree is countable, it represents 10 square feet of cross-sectional acre per area. 10 square feet of basal area, excuse me, per acre. And if you think about it, if we came to the DBH point and saw the tree off, measured the diameter of that circle and figured out how many square feet it is, is in it, that's what we're talking about. So if the tree is 
when the prism is displaced, but not outside itself, it counts. If it's displaced completely outside of itself, it doesn't. And Charlie Dubay has asked a question about a marginal tree. And the rule of thumb is count every other one. This is not every other one in the plot. This is about every other one for the, for the crews. So if plot number one has one tree that's marginal, marginal, if you count that one and go to plot two and there's a marginal tree, you don't count that. Plot three, if you had one, you would. If you had two trees in it, it's always going to be from the first plots you did, it's count, skip, count, skip, all the way through the crews, if that helps. The point here is there's a strong linkage between site index, which has got something to do with what you're looking at in your soil section of the contest, how well the tree is going to grow. And the way we do this in the East is site index is the tree height at age 50. And that's uh, for a specific species on a given site. So if we have a site index for white pine of 100, that means we're expecting the tree at age 50 to be 100 feet tall. All right. The rule of thumb, though, is that if the basal area is 20 square feet over the site index value, cut back to 10 under for an improvement cut. So if the site index for the white pine site was 100, we went in there and measured it and found out we had 150 square feet, then it's time to do a cutting, okay? Urban forestry is becoming more and more important. And as we look at global warming, we're seeing a great, greater increase in planting trees in communities and whatnot. They add value to the property. They do a lot for mental health. And uh, you got to be careful which ones you plant so that they do survive. Forest products uh, as a renewable resource. Um, everybody thinks about wood and paper. But there's some other things that come out of the forest. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of interest in wood pellets, which are things that weren't big enough to uh, make saw timber out of, or, or at least boards could be the slabs off of them. Um, they can be reconfigured. There's a thing called biochar. It's uh, becoming more interesting. Um, think of briquettes for uh, grilling steaks or biochar is also added back into some soils to up the amount of carbon that's in them. Uh, anything else that you can think of that's reconfigured would fall into that category. This was a discussion that was had some years ago about ecosystem services. Who pays it? We all know that forests improve air quality, but this is the reason I think that the idea of forest all districts has been successful is that we're giving the landowner a break on his taxes in order to do these things that improve ecosystem services, such as air quality. The cleanest water comes from where? A forested land cover. A wildlife habitat is a side benefit and then recreation. This is um, one of the things about the special issue topic that's come up, it's not often we have one that has anything to do with forestry, but there's some terms that you may want to be familiar with. Uh, ground and water, how ground uh, and surface water systems function. Um, topography, steeper topography, the faster it drains off. Geology, um, if you have rocks that are somewhat porous and not in addition to the soil soaking it up, the rocks will. Karst terrain, we all know, is one of those things that uh, allows water to in, uh, percolate in uh, rather quickly. Aquifers, aquitars, aquacludes. An aquaclude is a rock strata that really inhibits water moving through it. So if you want to look at an aquifer that's that porous stone that allows water to move through it, if you don't have a strata that is an aquaclude underneath it, the thing's going to continue to leak downward in, in the ground. Aquatars are just poor aquacludes. 
stormwater runoff is becoming more and more of an issue. Um, but this is the thing about water quality and quantity. Forest, managed and unmanaged, and repairing buffers are critical to maintaining this and understanding um, for quality indicators in different landscapes. I think if you're um, look at water chemistry, things that are dissolved in it, the physical conditions, such as whether or not it bubbles over rocks, has a huge sediment load and whatnot, and the macro vertebrates, vertebrates excuse me, that live in it are indicators of how that uh, water is. I think these things were in the uh, slide pack that you've got, but uh, this is one of those things about forest management. A lot of people say, oh, they cut the forest and you get all kinds of sediment out of it. But that's why Virginia has a BMP program that um, uh, gets the, the, the loggers to do things in such a manner as that you don't have problems with water quality. And it's probably a good idea to utilize those kind of techniques and particularly with agriculture for all land uses. Um, water withdrawal. If you remember, many of the reservoirs out west are kind of not holding as much water as they used to, not because they leaked, because they haven't been refilled. And water management, everybody likes to drill wells and take out water from rivers, but this is an important thing about how much you take out and when you take it um, for the preservation of the ecosystem down the road or even in an annual basis. Um, Runoff and wastewater, we're seeing more and more people taking runoff and running it to sediment ponds where it gets to sit and the sediments settle out of it before they discharge or don't discharge at all. And wastewater renovation, um, uh, more and more communities have sewage plants that are doing an excellent job in renovating water. And this is one of those things that uh, goes along with the protection. Um, the scaling up actions from local to regional to national levels, it's great to have a national plan, but if you don't have it working at the local level, it's hard to, hard to get it to uh, really make an impact. So the trick to it is, although you may do something at a local level, you need to figure out how to scale it up to the regional and national levels. And this is the point where I've spent a lot of time um, in my working career. It's interesting when you have a, a meeting and you have uh, a wide variety of interests coming to discuss it. You have conflicting points of view and I always view that as an educational opportunity to uh, get the science into the decision. Anyway, Larissa, you're up. Okay, well, it looks like that uh, we don't have any questions at this time listed. Um, would anybody Charlie like Bay's to- Charlie got to have one. I've never gone through a training session <laughs> and had at least one. Charlie, Charlie, well, does, Charlie does have one. This is the time. No, it's on there, I think. Where's, oh, where's Charlie? No, I don't have anything. I got at this one. Time. In, maybe you put it in the other chat. It says, "Please describe what a shelter wood system looks like. What is actually done? Are patches left bare, or is it just a general thinning?" Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. A shelter wood system looks um, like a park. Uh, you've reduced the number of trees in it so that if your mature seed source trees, the ones that are left standing. And remember about that partial sunlight, not full sunlight on the forest floor. So it's like a park. If you want to take a look at the basal area that's involved in it, it's probably around 35 square feet. So it's it's an open stand. Anybody else? I have one. Could you cool. briefly describe the Doyle Scribner and International, the differences and when you would use them? Sure. Um, the Doyle rule is one of those rules that is, has been used in the South, but it's somewhat of a biased rule. It, um, 
The internet, well, let's start off the other way. The international rule is probably, the international quarter inch rule produces the best, um, if you scale a log with that type of rule, you usually cut out what you get. Um, I've got a, a chart buried in my computer someplace, Brent, that shows what happens um, as size changes with those three rules. And I'd be glad to send it to you I, if you tell me your email. Okay, I'll, I'll shoot you one. Okay, you got mine? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll just say, share the chart with you. Sure. But uh, yeah, the international is the fairest one. Doyle is biased okay. in one direction, Scribner's biased in another. Okay. But we are going to do everything based on international. That's so. Anybody else? Since we're not writing them, we're asking them, raise your hand and come on. I couldn't have done that good a job with the slide. <laughs> but you I'll do, ask. John, you do. What's a oh. southern bolt? Huh? What's a southern bolt? A southern bolt? Yeah. Bolts typically are five foot. And I think a southern one, I'm not sure. I think a southern one was four. But they're okay. kind of more for I come from there are five. Okay. There's there's things called bolter mills where they take high high value wood that's not big enough to really make a saw log. And a little bolter mill is almost one of these hand feed jobs. Uh, it's not very complicated, but it's a it's a good way to take short pieces, less than half a log and saw them up into things that you can glue back together and whatnot. Boulder mills used to be real popular, but I think they've kind of fallen by the wayside now. Furniture industries are ones that were associated most with uh, furniture. Industries. Anybody else? That was a good question, Brent. Thank you. Charlie also, had, um... Charlie also had one that says, I, I read that Loblolly Pines are measured at 25 years for site index. Others are at age 50. Is this correct? Yes, it is. And if you go out west, it's usually a base index of 100. So it depends on where you are. But the, the rules still all, all apply with the uh, basal area. I think what's happened with Loblolly, you've done such a good job over time with uh, developing uh, genetic, so improving the genetics of the tree that they grow faster. And a lot of times for us people that started in the dark ages, it took quite a while to get a, a tree big enough to really harvest. And now some of these trees are growing so fast that instead of having, you're waiting about half the time to get uh, a good economic return on them. Part of sustainable forestry. As the population increases, the forest demand increases. So it's good that those kinds of things are happening. Okay, uh, I've got a question that's uh, popped up. Uh, and it is, um, can, you, can you clear cut even if you have some logs that are only half logs, not one or one half? One and uh, the rule of thumb that we are using in this contest to measure the volume that's out there in our sample plot is based on that one log, half log. If once you've bought the track, at that point, whatever, depending on how the contract is written, you're going to salvage everything. Is it worth it to cut down a half log tree? Eh. That's one of those things that depends on the size. If it's a high dollar value wood product, the answer is yes, otherwise it may still go to the chipper. It's one of those problems of how much effort do you want to put in to cutting down and handling that log versus what it's worth? And as a rule of thumb, if a tree doesn't have at least one log in it, it's probably not going to go to the sawmill, or at least that portion of it that's, that's qualifies. 
But yeah, once you start cutting, it doesn't make a difference when it's got one log or a half log. We just don't include that, value, that volume to determine the value, if that helps. All right. Uh, another one we have here is, uh, does wastewater reno <clears throat> renovation refer to programs like SWIFT, S-W-I-F-T? If you share with me what SWIFT stands for. I, I know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe we could get some clarification on, on that, that question. Right? There's another one I think popped up about site index based off the number of trees. Yeah. Yeah. Think they're plot? No. Site index is based on the soil series. So if you, and this is not done as much as it used to be done, but if you look at soil surveys, they'll give you some site index hints for trees that are common in the area. So the site index is based on the soil survey data, if that helps. What is my favorite tree? <laughs> Sugar maple, oh. maple syrup. Okay. Moving along. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, John. You, well, you might, uh, are there any more developments with the expansion of emerald ash borers and or any other invasive species? Yeah, the emerald ash borer seems like something that's really hard to stop and it's affecting more and more uh, trees in a wider area. One of the interesting things about that is supposing you had a job as the buying ash trees for the baseball bat industry, what's the longevity of your employment opportunity? Uh, talk to the ash borer. Um, other invasive species. We've had a, a, a number of problems with a wide variety of things. The hemlock in Virginia has really been hit hard with the woolly adelgid. Um, yeah. There's some um, insects being evaluated for release that uh, pretty much target just them. And this is a nice way of dealing with it. If you release uh, insect that's main diet is woolly and delgin, once they've eaten themselves out of house at home, they have a tendency to disappear. Um, everybody knows, I think about gypsy moth and its problems. Um, they're more controlled now than they have been in the past. Uh, there's uh, BT bacteria that are being sprayed on them that, that are adverse to their health. Um, the biggest problems that I think when we look right around the central Virginia area now are things that are viney that climbs up the trees, English ivy being a, a big culprit. And right. there's some other things that uh, as the vines take over, they get up in the top of the tree and shade out the leaves. And then we know what happens with that. Trees produce less food and goes into decline and then all kinds of things can attack it and it dies. So there are a lot of groups now that are working on removing invasives and many of them, it's just a matter of going out and digging them up before they go to seed. Hmm. Stilt grass is a good example. What else yeah. we got, folks? Once that gets started, man, that's that's a that's tough. Because I think well, it's, the thing, the thing um, about stilt grass is it produces so many seeds that it only takes a few plants to really seed in an area. And if you pull it after it's gone to seed, you've wasted your time. You got to pull it early before it goes to seed, and yeah. pulling is about the best way to get it out. So. And it takes years and years to, con yes. to control it. Yeah. It does. Um, okay, so we have a little more clarification on what SWIFT meant is, okay. what it means, a sustainable water initiative for tomorrow. They clean their wastewater and return it to the aquifer. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate that clarification. I didn't know what SWIFT meant, what it stood for. So back to the question, if does, does wastewater renovation refer to programs like Sustainable Water Initiative for Tomorrow? Could easily refer to them. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, 
Here's the one. And I was thinking the same thing, Jacob, uh, the lanternfly, it, it crossed my mind too. Um, since we were on the, on the topic of invasives, uh, Jacob asked as the lantern, does the lanternfly predictions as bad or worse as they previously were? And would the lanternfly help to decrease Alanthus? Well, yeah, but the trouble is it takes out a lot of other things with it. So with it. no, that is not a good thing. That's a side bit, but it's not a good thing. Um, Virginia Tech, for one, has been working on a, a program to uh, do a Lanthus in, and it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. They're injecting, uh, excuse me, I can't remember if it's a bacteria or a virus, bacteria, I think, into the tree that spreads through the root. So you only have to inject one tree in the stand and all the interconnected ones go out too. Um, uh, there's things like that that are probably more appropriate than letting one, one invasive tackle another invasive because it's not that specific. Huh. Some of the are other there... things that work with removal of invasives, I think uh, Blue Ridge Prism in Central Virginia is probably the best example of it. Extension does. Um, Department of Forestry. There's also some other nonprofits, I'm sure, that that encourage that. Mm -hmm. Master Naturalist, part of their training program is all about invasives and how do you remove them, and they do some work projects on that. So yeah, there's a lot of people working on it, but there's also an awful lot out there in the landscape that make it an ongoing program. It's like what you were saying, Tristan, about uh, still grass. Um, just because you did it on the track of land uh, last year doesn't mean you don't get to go out and visit it again this year. Do it again, right. Right. Um, I, I have a, a question. Um, could you, I, I haven't heard of the word uh, aqu uh, aqu aquilid. When it includes uh, Yes, could, could you tell me that, could you tell us the difference in in those, those are new, that's new vocabulary to me. Oops, where'd I go? When we think of an aquifer, if you look at um, the spring on the hillside, that's where an aquifer is discharging. And if it's high on the hill, Everything up above it must be fractured uh, to allow water to accumulate there. Now, why does the why is the spring located where it is? Well, underneath that rock strata is an aquaclude, which is a strata that's dense and doesn't allow water to infiltrate. Um, oh. Oh. All right. Yeah. Okay. All it's right. like putting a piece of concrete underneath that sponge. <laughs> sure. So sponge fill oh. up. And an aqua tard is just a poor aqua clue. And karst is one of those things. If you have an aquifer and a sandstone or something, usually it stays intact. Karst, that limestone rock, has a tendency to dissolve because rainwater is somewhat acidic. And as it goes through um, the soils, uh, it usually picks up a little bit more acidic material and uh, dissolve. So that makes an interesting thing about years ago, we used to see people throw trash in sinkholes because it kind of disappeared. Well, it did, but the trouble was that stream that was flowing through the car underneath the sinkhole, which is a place where it's collapsed, has uh, now been uh, oh, impacted by all the polluted materials we put in it. So that's why the, the geology thing is real Real important. It's where you are in the topography and what geologic structures you're looking at. Good okay. question. All right. Well, uh, there's uh, one more question. We only have about a minute and a half remaining. Water. And this question is, are there, ooh, are there any types of trees that filter water better than others? And if so, could you please list a few? As a general rule of thumb, any forest buffer over 50 feet does a good job of filtering water out as long as you've got good forest health in it. A tree that's dying isn't soaking up a lot of stuff. 
as far as one better than another, some species of trees soak up a lot of water. And if you look at uh, some of the hybrid poplars, uh, need a lot of water and you can use them as a planting over a site that you're trying to uh, remove polluted waters from, then it gets locked up in the tree stems. So most any open grown tree is gonna suck up a lot of water and that's one way of getting polluted waters out of the system. But they do use a variety of trees in special, um, like a super fun site where they're trying to get polluted ground, shallow polluted groundwater, something the tree root could reach. Trees are a good way of sucking it up out of there. All right. Well, that's going to uh, that's going to be our last ask, question. Yeah, and, I just want to oh. clarify something here, Mister Mister. This is Charlie Dubay. Mister Rocket said earlier that site index for loblolly pine would be. 25 years in the purposes of this competition, if that question were asked, Blood Pine would be 25 years for site index and all others would be 50. Is that correct? Probably, but, it, but the question itself will define that, so don't worry about it. Okay. Be defined in the question. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right. Well, John, thank you ever so much for uh, helping us with this advanced forestry session. Um, as always, outstanding information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome, man. I'm looking forward.